So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Brown, who probably doesn't need any uh, introduction anymore. I don't know if you officially qualify as a new faculty still, um, but it's really been a pleasure to uh, see the growth of our thoracic uh, surgery program under Dr. Cook's leadership. I've been able to build this program and have earned a variety of uh, high-level awards for the outstanding uh, work particularly in lung cancer and the early detection of lung cancer. It's really uh, been an outstanding group altogether. But thoracic surgeons get involved in uh, lots of complex care beyond lung cancer. You sort of think of thoracic surgeons often as the lung cancer docs, but are often involved in a variety of complex uh, procedures related to uh, the foregut and things that present themselves in the chest. So with that, we're going to learn some more about how to manage some of these complex things. Thanks, okay. Lisa. Thanks. It's a good point. When the uh, stomach comes up into the chest, it's uh, technically in our turf, I guess. All right, so let me know if you can't hear me or if everything is okay here. So let's talk about uh, parasophageal hernias today. And I really wanted to kind of review the literature and take an evidence-based approach to this. So today, I'd like to review the anatomy and physiology of parasophageal hernias and the indications for repair, controversies regarding the intraoperative techniques that we use, and postoperative outcomes. So just to review the anatomy of the diaphragm, the crura are a pair of elongated musculotendinous bundles. So they arise from the anterior surface of the lumbar vertebrae. Uh, the right is L1 through L4, left is L1, L2. The right one inserts on the central tendon, and importantly, it actually splits uh, as it approaches that tendon to form the esophageal hiatus. So even though in the or in the OR we say right and left, uh, the right crura actually, you know, right cruise contributes to the right and the left side. So it's important to, to know this anatomy and be familiar with it, um, especially posteriorly as the aorta is kind of creeping up behind there. So an another important structure that we think about a lot uh, when we think about foregut is the frenoesophageal ligament. And basically, it's a connective tissue sheath. So as you know, the esophagus lies in the hiatus uh, between the limbs of the, uh, the crura, and this sheath basically secures the esophagus in an intra-abdominal location. So it goes above the diaphragm, below the diaphragm, and then there's always a little fat pad um, circumferentially around the intra-abdominal portion of it. And so a lot of these hernias are related to laxity and weakening of that ligament. So what is the lower esophageal sphincter? So it's a little different than most things that we're used to. We're used to anatomic structures, you know, the aortic valve, things that are very straightforward, but it's not really a distinct anatomic structure. So it's a high pressure zone that is composed of a lot of different uh, components. And so there's basically four. There's the intrinsic musculature of the lower uh, esophagus, which is in a state of tonic contraction so that we don't have reflux. It, Re relaxes when we swallow, but then it tightens up again. Uh, second, there are sling fibers that are part of the uh, gastric cardia, and they're at the same depth as the circular muscle fibers of the esophagus. And so they're oriented diagonally, and they kind of come across um, from the cardia, and they go down to the lesser curve. Those fibers are really important uh, as well in preventing reflux, and they're an important part of the, historically, a part of the hill repair. Uh, the crur of the diaphragm also plays a huge role. You see that there's a small part of the esophagus that's intra-abdominal. And so especially when you take a deep breath in, um, the way that it works is it kind of pinches, the crur pinches in an AP direction and prevents reflux of contents back up into your esophagus. And then last but not least, intra-abdominal pressure. So there's intra-abdominal pressure is positive, compresses on the distal esophagus, and keeps that sphincter intact. There's a lot going on in that area, and I always call it kind of a high rent district because um, you have the frontosophageal ligament that can get weak, the heart's kind of pounding away, the diaphragm's constantly moving, and so there are a lot of forces kind of acting uh, in a way that could, you know, um, you know, basically compromise your repair. So this is always on your ab site and on your exams. This is the hiatal hernia classification. So type one is sliding. This is the most common one we see. It's 95% of patients have it. It's really, it's not something you really 
kind of get too excited about unless a patient has reflux that's refractory to medical therapy. So very common, basically the lower esophageal sphincter ends up above the diaphragm. Um, you have an incompetent LES because the LES is now subject to the negative intrathoracic pressure, so it pulls everything apart. The intra-abdominal pressure is still pushing up, and then the diaphragm no longer gets to pinch on the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. So there's a lot of, a lot of factors at play leading to reflux. It makes the reflux worse, so it's kind of a circular um, physiology. The other thing you lose is you lose that angle of hiss, which is actually also an anti-reflux barrier as well. So those patients usually present with reflux. Type 2 is kind of the true paraesophageal hernia where the GE junction is still actually intra-abdominal, but the gastric fundus slips up anteriorly alongside the esophagus. A true type 2 is actually quite rare. You, you rarely see that. What we usually see is type 3. Type 3 is the start of it is where the fundus rotates anteriorly, slides up along the um, distal esophagus, and then eventually the GE junction follows, and then before you know it, everything's in the chest. And then last but not least is the, the type 4, where you have other organs in the chest. Um, and also from a, from a classification standpoint, if greater than 30% of the stomach is in the chest, it's technically called the giant paraesophageal hernia. That's an important distinction to make when you're reading the papers to figure out you know, how extreme were these hernias. So interestingly, despite being such a common problem, the pathophysiology is not entirely clear. We haven't really sorted this all out, and I thought one paper explained it well and reviewed the data behind it, which there isn't really much, and uh, it's different than, you know, abdominal aortic aneurysms where they really figured out, you know, the matrix, the MMPs and collagen, and, and that's all been kind of sorted out. It's totally different here, so there's a couple different themes. So we know first that increased intra-abdominal pressure really contributes to displacing the GE junction into the chest. Um, I think you see this a lot, especially in the United States. Obesity is a problem. A lot of patients with reflux and uh, PPIs are probably the most, one of the most common medications people are on besides statins. Um, a second theory is that there's esophageal shortening and there's been animal studies and some, some human studies showing that some of the, va the vagus nerve is actually injured or not working quite right because they're supposed to be um, technically the lower esophageal sphincter and the distal esophagus can be pulled up into the chest by the longitudinal muscles, but the vagus nerve inhibits that pathway uh, with the innervation. And so if that's disrupted, then the longitudinal muscles kind of do this yanking motion and try to pull things into the chest. And then last but not least, uh, there's actually the most data to support widening of the hiatus. So it's basically a breakdown of the frontal esophageal ligament uh, you lose elasticity with age. Uh, there's collagen defects and all sorts of um, problems that contribute to the esophageal hiatus basically becoming lax and widening. So I think the most important thing to think about is, you know, what is the clinical presentation and what do we do? Because I think as a thoracic surgeon, I, th I see many patients with cancer and patients always have options. It's, you know, and some may forego cancer therapy, but for the most part, if somebody has cancer, you're probably gonna treat it. Uh, it's a different scenario with hernias because it's, it's not, most of them are not life-threatening. It's a quality of life issue. A lot of these patients are older, have comorbidities, and they're not excited about having an operation. So how do they present? Well, many of them are asymptomatic. So we see them on imaging, uh, and then I think if you ask enough questions, you can find symptoms and relate them to the hernia. Um, these are mainly mechanical symptoms. So talked about type one, the sliding, being reflux. A lot of these patients have reflux, but they come in with uh, the obstruction, incarceration, strangulation sequence that you're all aware of. That's actually pretty uncommon. Early satiety, chest pain, dyspnea. Um, they can have iron deficiency anemia because of the Cameron's ulcers, which is chronic venous congestion. And so basically, this is kind of how they present. And the challenge is that they're older patients, and they the hernia tends to evolve over time. And so they modify their diet, they make changes in their lifestyle, they kind of live with it, 
and then by the time they're 80, 100% of the stomach is in their chest and they're just really uncomfortable. Um, so some argument there to maybe repair these a little earlier if they're truly symptomatic. So we see an imaging. Okay, so you might see the incidental chest x-ray, you know, with the large air fluid level in the mediastinum. You might see the CT scan with the entire stomach behind the left atrium. Um, imagine it's, it takes up a lot of space, so you can see why it causes all these obstructive and mechanical symptoms. And a classic esophagram. So you see the GE junction above, well above the diaphragm, as well as the gastric uh, fundus. So when, when do we operate for this? I think this one's also usually on your exams, although this happens uncommonly, is uh, when you have a gastric volvulus. So there can be twisting of that stomach along two different axes, and one is uh, along the long axis, was it organo organoaxial, which is most common, and then there was mesoenteroaxial. So this is, you know, kind of the board tri triad patients. Patient is in not, they're not quite an extremis unless they're strangulated, but they come in, they're, they're very uncomfortable. They have severe epigastric pain. Uh, it's helpful if they know they had a history of hiatal hernia. They retch, but nothing really comes up because it's mechanically obstructed. So they're retching and retching and nothing happens. And you really can't pass an NG tube. So you take that patient to the OR, you do the EGD, you check the gastric mucosa. And that's kind of your decision point. If the mucosa is okay, you put an NG tube and you kind of let let the inflammation settle, but still repair it in a semi-urgent fashion. But if you know if that the if the stomach's strangulated, then you got to kind of move ahead there and decompress it. So, continue with indications. Historically, there is this fear of, you know incarceration and strangulation, and there's a high mortality rate with emergent repair. These are old patients, um, so let's repair them all. That was, I think that was the mantra. Um, over time, uh, people have questioned that. Now the challenge is we don't have these big population-based studies. So by that I mean, we don't know the denominator. When you don't know the denominator, you really don't know the incidence. So you don't know the number of people walking around out there with a hiatal hernia and so you don't know what percent are symptomatic. Um, so there's not a lot of population-based study to say who's going to, you know, followed for longitudinally for a long time and say, this is the percentage of people who are going to present with incarceration, strangulation, and, and we're worried or we're not worried. But we do know that the mortality rate of an emergent repair is high, is 5.4%, and the mortality rate of an elective repair is 1.4%. <coughs> so it's not zero, okay? There was a... Uh, it's a very interesting study at using Markov myelin, which I really like for problems like this, because you don't, you're not going to have the answer because you don't know the denominator, and then even if you had it, you'd have to follow those patients for 20, 30 years. So I, I think these are interesting studies where you take um, percentages and probabilities and, and you come to a conclusion. So what this study did was it, it compared, um, basically took uh, this lifetime risk and said, okay, what's the lifetime risk of developing acute symptoms and then needing emergent repair? And they said it's age dependent. So you have to think about what is the patient's life expectancy. So if the annual probability of emergent repair is 1.1%, and let's say you have a 65 year old patient who's got a life expectancy more of 17.7 .7 years, which is actually generous. Um, and you do the calculations, then the risk of developing <coughs> acute symptoms is 18% in a 65-year-old patient. Okay, that sounds high. But the overall lifetime risk of death due to this kind of watchful waiting approach is you take the 18% times the percent risk of emergent repair, and you actually, it's, it's still just 1%. Um, so at the end of the day, compare it to mortality rate of an elective repair, and this paper actually put a lot of people <coughs> at ease um, and said, okay, maybe we need to rethink this and not, you know, this isn't happening as frequently as we think it is. And what they concluded was that watchful waiting is an appropriate treatment strategy for asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, and that's an important qualifier. This is not the patient who comes in with chest pain every time after they have a large meal, okay? So, you know, we focus uh, on these patients on the assessment of symptoms. 
uh, and we, like I said, we don't know the actual number of symptomatic patients, the percent wise, because we don't know the denominator. But when you look at um, this table, and this is, shows the percent of intrathoracic stomach, and as, as the percentage increases, you see as you, the older you get, the more of your stomach is in your chest. So this is definitely an evolution. This is, these things evolve over time. And at the higher uh, percentages of intrathoracic stomach, you know, you have more uh, the chest pain, early satiety, and the dyspnea, really obstructive symptoms. And I had a patient recently who said, you know, after every time I eat dinner, I have a huge dinner, then I have chest pain, it's just terrible, and I can't breathe, and this was like every single night. So, you know, it is a huge quality of life uh, factor. And so this is a study from um, Dr. Lowe's group up at Virginia Mason. And they were trying to, you know, make the claim for repairing more of these than not. And you got to be careful when you read all these papers because you, you can really figure out who the aggressive groups are and who the, who the kind of non-aggressive groups are. Who's writing it? And is it a surgeon or is it GI? And try to frame your mind, well, you know, while you're reading it uh, in that mindset. So this this group had a lot of symptoms, and this is I'm surprised for a contemporary series. Uh, actually, only 10% of these were done laparoscopically. These were all done open. Uh, they were non-emergent, and but they were still making the claim to, you know, repair them more often than not. And actually, part of the title was making the case for routine surgical repair. And they had a 40% complication rate, almost 40%. So, I don't know. I kind of read this and thought that I don't really, you know, agree with that. Having such a high <coughs> complication rate, a large open series, and I know these patients are symptomatic, but I think the patients who are it's truly affecting their quality of life, and you have a good conversation with them about risks, benefits of watchful waiting versus uh, repair is really important. And one of the, one of the few studies that's actually cited a, a lot, um, if her, uh, probably not what it was proposed to do, was by Mark Allen um, back in 1993 at the Mayo Clinic. And they had 147 patients with, with an intrathoracic stomach. And most of these studies I'm talking about are kind of the giant parasophageal hernias. These aren't the, the easy ones. And you know they repaired most of them, but what what kind of rang out in the study was the 23 patients who did not undergo surgery. And you know institutions like Mayo Clinic and and uh, places like that are notorious for following patients for a long time and having really good data. And what they found after a median follow-up of six and a half years, following some patients out to 20 years, was that actually none of them presented with acute strangulation or incarceration. I mean, one patient died of aspiration. Um, and four had progressive symptoms. So, you know, they followed them for this kind of the longest follow-up. And what they concluded was that these patients with an intrathoracic stomach who have obstructive symptoms uh, at presentation, yeah, they should undergo repair. And elective operation is safe, uh, but, you know, this whole strangulation fear is, um, is actually quite rare. <coughs> so the key steps for, for these cases um, is port placement and exposure, and you mobilize the distal esophagus and the upper stomach, take down the short gastrics, do a mediastinal dissection, reduce the hernia, uh, complete the sac dissection, excise the entire hernia sac, close the cura, and do a fundoplication. Now, if you go on any of these cases, like even a you know, lap Nissen for reflux with a sliding hiatal hernia or a parasophageal, interestingly, like, all the, the steps, as I've out, kind of outlined, are the same, but there's so many nuances um, that you don't appreciate until you really start doing a bunch and spending time with people who, who do a lot of these. Uh, so one major force, a couple forces that we ha are up against in the OR is tension, and we know that you know, general surgery basic tenet is don't repair things that are under tension or try not to have tension. So we have axial tension, which is the, the, length, uh, the tension along the length of the esophagus, and a lot of people have a short esophagus because there's a lot of stomach in the chest. And so you see the vector, the big arrow there, and I always tell the patients, you know, all forces want to push your stomach and the repair back up into the chest. And then the second is radial tension. And so that's a, a diaphragmatic curl problem when you get in and you see this huge hole, the gaping hole, you think, Ugh, how are we going to get that together without tension? So it's funny, the short esophagus has been a, a, a bone of contention for a long time. And starting out at UCSF, you know, Dr. Larry Way said it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it does not exist. And there are still some papers out there who 
it's funny, they'll, pre they'll publish their series and they'll say, well, we never had to do a colis, so therefore there's no such thing as a short esophagus. Um, well, that's great for your series. Uh, I, I think that the data suggests that it does exist. Now we know as surgeons what happens when things get injured. You have edema, you have inflammation, you have fibrosis, things contract. Well, what do you think happens to the distal esophagus with all this reflux? Hydrogen ions are the culprit. They basically injure the you know, esophageal uh, wall, mucosa and the wall. You get localized cellular damage. The squamous epithelium, by the way, is a terrible barrier um, to reflux contents. It gets injured really easily and you have the same thing. You have edema, your end game is fibrosis. It goes, tra it stems transmurally and after repeated cycles of this, well then you have collagen. So if the collagen uh, presents itself in a circumferential fashion, you get a peptic stricture. If it goes longitudinally, you get a short esophagus. And I think most people would agree with this, but there are still some contemporary papers that deny it. Um, and this is, I thought this was a good depiction from some people, uh, some folks at the University of Washington who show that there's this kind of apparent short esophagus where the, it's just kind of accordion and that can be reduced quite easily. Or there really is a short esophagus from distal esophageal fibrosis, but sometimes you can reduce it and sometimes you can't. So that's something that actually you can only figure out in the OR. So you have to kind of be ready in the operating room because if you, even if you look at your barium esophagram pre-op, the positive predictive value of being able to say short esophagus or not is only 50%. It's like flipping a coin. So you can't go in and say, oh gosh, I know we're going to have to do a colis. Um, you actually you don't know that until you're in there and you really start to work with the tissues. So how do we deal with this intraoperatively? Well, you have to start by mobilizing the distal three to four centimeters of the esophagus, which is technically called the type one mediastinal dissection. And you'll see us taking the graspers and constantly kind of measuring, you know, what intra-abdominal distance we have on the, on the esophagus. Two and a half to three centimeters is the goal. You should probably take off, excise the fat pad anteriorly, and you may even need your colleague to scope and um, to kind of transilluminate to really make sure you know where that GE junction <coughs> is. Not only for this, to make sure that you have enough distal esophagus in, but another um, mistake some people make is that it sounds funny, but if you don't have enough in there, you don't really know where the distal esophagus is, you have to put the wrap around the distal esophagus. One um, kind of mistake in a lot of patients, people's early series is they maybe wrap the distal stomach. <coughs> so that's not going to hold. So you do your type 1 dissection, and then you reassess. Okay, if you still don't have it, you have to do a type 2 mediastinal dissection. And again, I don't know what it is about foregut surgeons, probably is that most of them are thoracic surgeons, but there's a lot of uh, dissension about, you know, what is a type 2 dissection, so everyone wants to define it differently, so this doesn't surprise me. Some say 8 centimeters, some say 10 centimeters. Swanstrom group says up to the crina. Uh, Demetrius group says up to the inferior pulmonary veins, so that's a moving target. I think if you just are consistent, and I think if you just, by the end of the day, just take it as high as you can, as high as you're comfortable, and then see what you have after you've done that dissection, and if you still don't have enough intra-abdominal length, well then you should do a collis. So what is this collis gastroplasty? Um, and this was originally done through a left oracle abdominal incision by Dr. Collis in 1957. Um, but we now can do it laparoscopically. We typically put a bougie down, about a 44 French, and then take um, usually purple loads take the first one uh, kind of coming towards the bougie and then the next one goes parallel to it and then what you end up with is kind of a wedge-shaped um, part of the stomach that you excise and then you do your wrap around that so you end up with you know covering that staple line with your wrap although you know doing a collis does increase your leak rate and you have to explain that that's been shown in many series you have to explain that to the patient um, but I think it's an important uh, skill to have so that you have that decreased axial tension so radial tension is something that's a little less um, a little less talked about in literature and historically people would just close the hiatus under tension and reinforce with mesh or um, they would you know if there was excessive tension and you couldn't get it together they would just kind of bridge the hiatus with a with a synthetic mesh so we now know that you know this biologic mesh reinforcement doesn't reduce long-term risk of recurrence and a, a huge no-no is to put a synthetic mesh at the hiatus. So there was a time when people were doing that. 
um, and there were a lot of erosions uh, and stenoses. So, so we know that we shouldn't be doing that. So I have a lot of respect for the group that I was with for a year up in Seattle at Swedish. Um, Brian Louie and his group are the, it's basically the only paper that took a objective approach to this. Usually we go in the R, we take the graspers, try to put the curve, you know, put the curve together and just say, ah, oh, you know, it's tense, it's not tense, and we just, over time, you just kind of get used to how it feels and you just subjectively assess this. But they actually used a, a, a gauge, a pressure gauge, and they went to the level and the hiatus where they thought, you know, they put their the most tense suture, and they took the gauge and they took the suture, put them together, measured it, and what they did in the study is they told the surgeon, just do what you would normally do based on your assessment, but we're just gonna take these measurements, we're not gonna tell you what they are. So they analyzed that, and then they also analyzed the shape, because they thought, well, maybe there's some geometry playing a role here, it's not just the, the width um, that we have to bring together. And so what they did was um, a few different things. And just talking about the relaxing maneuvers um, that are used, one is that you can create a left side of pneumothorax. And so it's really important to know that if you create like a wide open hole in that left pleura, it's fine. As long as there's a wide communication between the left pleural space and the abdomen, you know, when you have your CO2 pneumoperitoneum, that's fine. It's when you got a little hole and then you can have a ball valve effect that you can have the tension pneumothorax, okay? So that's one thing, because if you think about it, you've got all this tension on the diaphragm, you've got a pneumoperitoneum, you're doing your operation. You create a big left pneumothorax, well, then the diaphragm comes back down and, and there you have it, you can close it. So that's, that's actually one option. Second option is to create these uh, relaxing incisions on the right or the left, preferably the right, and I'll tell you why. Um, you create a relaxing incision, so the thought is, you know, create a full thickness incision in the diaphragm away from the important repair bring the curve together, you know, not under tension, do your repair, and then you can always patch with a PTFE actually um, on the right or the left. And so that's what people are doing now. So what they did was they had about 64 patients who had either sliding or paraesophageals, and uh, about 50 of them had tension after they did their dissection. And so they did relaxing maneuvers in 27 of them. And they only did right incisions or they did a left uh, pneumothorax and if the left pneumothorax didn't quite cut it then they also did a right relaxing incision and what they found was you know this is again I'm impressed because this is objective these are objective measurements that they showed of course as you would expect it, re it reduces the tension so no matter if you do the pneumothorax uh, maneuver or the relaxing incision or if you had to do both it's it's a significant change but the one important part that they that they discovered was that the correlation between the width and this tension was uh, only one to one about 35 percent of the time. So that there's there are other factors at play. So it's the shape of the hiatus, it's the geometry of the hiatus, it's the uh, geometry of the hernia, and so there are other factors at play than just what's the width. So you have to think kind of uh, geometrically. So how do you do these relaxing incisions? And on the right, you basically, you, you do your incision um, parallel to the right cruise, and you have to obviously avoid the cava and leave a cuff there because you're gonna be sewing in uh, PTFE. You do a full thickness, this full thickness through the diaphragm um, into the right pleural space. And you start at the mid portion of the cruise and you work anteriorly until um, you almost get to the, the curl vein. Um, there's no need to go more posteriorly. You kinda wanna avoid where the circle and the star are because you don't wanna be by the aorta or the thoracic duct. Um, and you'll have definitely have enough to get you there. So then you sew in a PTFE, and you can use interrupted sutures for that um, uh, to basically close that defect. The left is a little different. Um, so to achieve a left-sided incision, you have to follow that dotted line there. And it starts to the left of the hiatus, follows the course of the seventh rib, um, and you usually have to go quite lateral, like pretty much pretty far towards the spleen. And the incision, what you wanna do, the reason why it's out there and you kinda of avoid that area where the P is, is because you could injure the phrenic nerve and you could cause left hemi diaphragm paralysis. You wanna avoid a radial incision there. So that's really, uh, really important. 
so that you know the University of Washington group and I don't know what it is up in there must be a lot of people with hiatal hernias in Seattle because there's enough to go around for University of Washington Virginia Mason and, and Swedish um, they're all high volume centers so this group um, published their series on relaxing incisions and you're never gonna get the tension versus tension on, on relaxing incision versus not so what what they did was they wanted to know what's the rate of recurrence in people who need a relaxing incision and then can, can we use biologic mesh. So the last one I showed you is PTFE. And what they did was, okay, if, the, if it comes together easily, we're just gonna primarily close it. If there's moderate to severe tension, we're gonna and reinforce it with a biologic mesh. And if the edges just won't come together and it's tearing, if the muscles are tearing, well then we're gonna do a relaxing incision and then we're gonna patch that with biologic mesh. So they did their usual practice and then what they ended up showing was that the 45% recurrence rate, and statistically, it wasn't different between the groups. And when I first read this, I thought, well, uh, yeah, you know, that makes sense. It's kind of what you'd expect. Um, but importantly, they said, okay, if you have an elevated hiatal tension, what their thought was that they're showing that by doing the relaxing incision, you brought the risk of recurrence down to just primary closure for people without it. So. So it does work. I think you would expect that number to be a lot higher than 56 if they hadn't done it. Um, one thing that was important that they found out that was not to use the biologic mesh on, uh, on the relaxing incision because two of the patients who had the left-sided relaxing incision actually ended up with a diaphragmatic defect on that side. They had to go back and repair it. So you've, you've got to use a synthetic there, especially on the left. So you can imagine the right, the liver's right there. It's less of a problem, um, but that's important. So speaking of mesh, it's kind of that mesh or no mesh scenario. And the same group, you know, this was a great multi-center randomized trial. Everyone quotes this one. Um, and they, they took uh, biologic mesh and said, okay, should we reinforce the crura? Would that decrease the recurrence rate? And there was a lot of enthusiasm for this at the time. And at six months, it was great. Yeah, 9% versus 24%. And I think the Cook company who makes this mesh was probably, you know, dancing in the streets. Um, and people started to use biologic mesh. Okay, but then five years later, they actually, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Now, they were very strict about how they defined recurrence. This is radiographic recurrence, and I have to throw that out there. You've gotten esophagrams on everybody, no matter what your symptoms are, and if there's a recurrence, um, radiologically, it counts, and it's, it's two centimeters was their definition, from the diaphragm to the vertical head of the wrap. And so of those, even at the six-month mark, of those who didn't have a recurrence, um, 12, a half, and each group would progress on at the five-year mark to have a recurrence. So I think uh, the authors were a little blown away by how high the recurrence rate actually was. I mean, they did use a strict definition, but, you know, I, I tell patients all the time, this, there's almost a 50% chance of this recurring, but you might not have symptoms. Um, so that's an important thing to tell your patients because, like, you know, all those uh, forces are against you, those tension forces. But importantly, you know, the symptom severity, there was no difference in the symptoms um, between the primary group and the biologic group. And also in, you know, people when they surveyed them for quality of life, these are all the surveys you usually give these types of patients. There's really no difference between the two groups. Both were, were quite happy. Um, so they thought that, you know, maybe these patients, why don't they have symptoms if they have a recurrence? And they thought that one was, well, they use a strict definition. It's not huge. It's not like you're taking them back to square one. It's not like their whole stomach's in their chest, so that's one. And two is maybe there's some surgical scar there presenting that, preventing the twisting that was happening before and things are kind of like socked in, even if the esophagram doesn't look perfect. So, you know, that's, that was just a hypothesis. That's how they, you know, provide an explanation for that finding. But one thing I, I found this very interesting is this pulmonary function um, issue because a lot of these patients do present with shortness of breath uh, dyspnea on exertion, and this is these are older patients, median age 74, and basically what this group showed was that every single parameter in pulmonary function testing and spirometry improved. So that's, I mean, it's hugely important because the greatest improvement was actually in the patients whose whole stomach was in their chest, not surprising because I showed you earlier that those patients have the most symptoms. Um, hernia size was a most important factor predicting improvement in pulmonary function. Uh, the most pronounced improvement was in old patients, patients with huge hernias, patients with the most impaired pulmonary function. And this rung, this kind of rung a bell with me because I thought, well, 
wow, would I actually offer this patient an operation? If I saw an 80-year-old patient with terrible pulmonary function, I'd say, oh, you're too high risk. You know, but maybe that's the person who would actually benefit most from surgery. So that's the kind of circular reasoning that um, you can run into when choosing patients for this operation it's, can be a challenge. And then, of course, you know, no, um, <laughs> no series of parasophageal hernias would be complete without discussing the Pittsburgh outcomes uh, with Dr. Lukatic and his group, and he usually publishes on giant parasophageal hernias, and that's exactly what this is. And I think they just basically kind of have a powerhouse there. They've done 653 of these over, you know, 11 years, and median age again, 70 years, and these are pretty sick patients. You know, half of them had a Charleston score at least three, and over the course of their series, they picked tougher and tougher, sicker and sicker patients to operate on. And I, I'm impressed that their mor morbidity rate was only 19%. Um, that's impressive for this cohort. The mortality rate was low. The reoperation rate was actually low as well. So, and I thought their tables, I really like the way that they presented the data because I know it may be a little bit small, but when they looked at the radiographic recurrence and it was yes or no, and then they compared the symptoms between those who had a radiographic recurrence or not. There's, there was no difference. So it's kind of the same as the last study. So even though you, you look at the you know, esophagram or you look at the imaging and you think, oh, I got a recurrence, well, all is not lost because you know, the patients were still happy. Okay, they, their symptoms were better. And the same is true with, you know, were they satisfied or not with the operation. Um, health, you know, GERD, health-related quality of life is one of the major surveys that we give to our patients before and after surgery, and also the SF36. So these patients were still happy, even if they had a radiographic recurrence because they weren't symptomatic. And so they concluded that, you know, laparoscopic uh, repair is it's feasible, it's safe. They completed it laparoscopically in 98.5% of their patients. Um, there was excellent symptom resolution and patient satisfaction, um, despite you know, having a pretty high risk cohort. Um, so basically, you know, at the mortality rate of 1.7, morbidity 19%, I think that you, know, you can achieve great, um, you know, patient satisfaction and good outcomes. So it's important to know these outcomes and know that, you know, think about where you are in your practice. Now this is a place that's done, you know, over 700 of these probably by this point. And just being able to know what the risks and benefits are and counsel the patient accordingly and say, you know, you might have a recurrence, but, you know, even if that's the case on imaging, you might not have symptoms, okay? And some of these morbidity rates and mortality rates, they're not trivial. So these are the important discussions. I think patient selection is a key um, component of being a foregut surgeon. And so with that, we'll take questions, but I just want to put a plug in for our reflux, dysphagia, and obesity CME conference. Um, it's in Monterey. So there you see like beautiful Monterey sandwich between a colon and a hiatus. <laughs> so I don't know. I think we just put the picture of Monterey and call it a day. Um, you know, our, our enrollment would probably be higher. <laughs> but, uh, but we're speaking and it'll be good. <laughs> Brown, thank you for that. You know, really um, thoughtful approach to a problem that kind of everybody thinks, oh, it's just an esophageal hernia. We can just fix this, and that all will be well and good. And that you really point out the value of following your patients long term. You know, does mesh really make a difference in six months versus two years? And that's what matters in people's lives is the difference we can make. And I think you really highlight that. I think we have some time for questions. Could you address the utility of gastroscopy tubes and fixing the stomach to the diaphragm like was commonplace before? Is that kind of out of favor or do you think that has some merit? Yeah, I think I, it's funny. I actually reviewed the literature looking specifically for like papers on that or, or data, and there really isn't a there isn't a lot. And I know that that was common practice. And when a patient came in for an emergent, I uh, had emergent volvulus and strangulation. The classic teaching was, "We'll just you know reduce that stomach." pexy it and put the G-tube in and get out. And so now I think that's kind of less and less common. Uh, I did see a presentation from the University of Washington group showing that how they do their pexy and only in kind of the sickest, kind of most dire circumstances do they do that. 
if we can, we try to get that patient to the OR, do the EGD. Um, maybe there was a higher, higher sus suspicion for strangulation of things and more, um, you know, upfront emergent repair. But now, if you can get that NG tube in and the mucosa looks okay, and you can get the patient's vitals kind of to settle out and things and get them looking better, you can repair it semi urgently kind of and do the good repair. I think that's still a good bailout maneuver for it a is. surgeon that may not be skilled in laparoscopic surgery or about distance just to reduce it, protect the stomach, and, uh, and be life safe. Because, but as you've noticed, the uh, incidence is pretty low. It used to be thought it was very high. We don't see that much. The patient will come up on a difficult call night. Right. You need to have that action. I agree, and if you're going to pexy it, it's important to you know put that G tube in, but also pexy it in maybe four or five different areas, kind of all along the greater curve. So you have to have a lot of points of fixation, and then you haven't burned any bridges. You can always go back if the patient isn't you know quite you know isn't frail or doesn't have a lot of comorbidities. You can always go back and still do a definitive repair. Right, Great presentation, thanks. He began with talking about four types, anatomical types of esophageal and parasophageal hernias. But then the discussion of most of the papers that followed that were about percent of the stomach that was up in the chest rather than the type of hernia that existed. Well, um, it, it, those papers that were talking about the recurrence rate, did it relate to the anatomical type of hernia or is the common, more common phase now just ignore the type of parasophageal hernias and just talk about percent of the stomachs in the chest? I'm a little confused about which one to rely on. Sure. So the class, the standard classification is still the most well accepted. And if you read, you know, the, the method sections of these papers, uh, the reason why I didn't put it in there is because most of them are type three. And so most of what we see is type three. Um, that's basically what they're, I'd say the majority of all those papers. And then they, and then the kind of finer tuning is how much of the stomach is in the chest. So if you use a logical match, I don't think 
and I, I those are those are excellent points and I, I agree I think that there are once in a great 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 while you need a collus but I think the problem is that most people don't aren't aggressive enough on the mediastinal dissection you rarely need to do a collus I'm talking about you should be doing like one or two a year um, and I agree with the mesh because they even you know identified that in their discussion or, or they highlighted the fact that well this is just one mesh that we tested <laughs> And there are better ones. We still use BioA. We use, I mean, there's a lot of great products out there. I, I use them and, and use, use it as reinforcement. So I think that it has to be redone. It has to, you know, that study needs to be redone with better mesh. I agree. Uh, last comment, Dr. Boyd. <laughs> so. You know, this they say, well, Larry Way used to say, and um, a lot of people say, you shouldn't really be doing these unless you've done 25 of them, yeah, well, like that's supervised. That's where, well, that's certainly the point. And that's what, what, what the advantage of your initiation of a program is, because it's my impression that a lot of people don't do a lot of these. And then when you get a guy like the Kessler who publishes 700, yeah. they're doing this day in, day out, they've got it down. And that's one of the advantages of these It's true. I mean, I would not be comfortable with this operation if I hadn't done, you know, a lot of them with a lot of different people who are all high volume surgeons and showing all the different techniques. And so there are data to show that there's a huge learning curve here, and that's not something that you should be doing two a year. So, Dr. Cook. Yeah, great talk, Lisa. It's, it's, uh, excellent. Uh, this conference that you point out uh, is just a, a surface of a lot of work. Uh, that's been a multi-specialty endeavor that Dr. Boyd touched on uh, between you, Dr. Carr, Dr. Badovsky, and Dr. Ali, and, and Ian Keith in developing a complex reflex center here at UC Davis with a lot of cool, <coughs> cool uh, uh, patient-centered uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, a quick question I have, and you, you kind of touched on one of your <coughs> illustrations that had Barrett's uh, within the esophagus on the illustration. Does the presence of Barrett's metaplasia uh, change your decision making in regards to a, a low symptomatic uh, large parasophageal hernia? And uh, on, is that one side? And on the on the post repair side, uh, if, when a patient has Barrett's, does it change your long term follow up strategy? No, I don't think so. There have been there were studies in the past showing that. Even if you, you know, obviously if someone has high-grade dysplasia or if they have kind of nodular Barrett's or something and, and you, you have a high concern, and you probably hold off and continue to survey that patient for a while and maybe even treat the Barrett's with, with um, Barrex treatment, you know, abortive <coughs> therapy, and then do your hernia repair. But even if you do the hernia repair, you, still, you can still survey those patients um, as needed. And, you know, the GI uh, community differs greatly on their recommendations in terms of surveying Barrett's esophagus. You know, some are kind of um, stoic about it and religious, and others will say, you know, this isn't really cost effective. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Yeah.